Good morning. How's everybody doing? Oh, I think we can do a little better than that. How's everybody doing? All right. It is so good to be together in person. I was telling a couple of folks earlier that I actually haven't been to a conference or an in-person event in a couple of years, so it feels good to be together and to see the energy of everybody. Uh, my name is Amy Chen, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Upside Foods, which was previously known as Memphis Meats. I'm excited to be kicking off the symposium today. I'm to having really great conversations over the next couple of days about the future of cultivated meat. I thought I'd start, though, by telling you a little bit about the journey that brought me here. I grew up in Texas, and like many kids at that age, didn't really know a lot about where my food came from. Things changed when I was about five. This is me um, and my grandmother, who was a little under five feet, but a real force of nature. My family went to Taiwan to go visit my relatives uh, who lived in rural Taiwan. What you don't see in this photo is the little chicken that my brother and I met at my grandparents' house. It would kind of peck around, and over the course of a couple of days and week, we became good friends. We would chase it around, we would feed it, and then we would squeal with delight when the chicken came to chase us. You probably know where this is going. Uh, then one day, we noticed that the chicken wasn't there anymore. We kind of hunted around the house and looked a couple times, and then finally asked my grandmother, where is the chicken? She's like, oh, you had it for dinner last night. And we groaned. And I first thought, oh, that was really good chicken last night. Um, and then I just felt really awful. Um, I remember sobbing uncontrollably. Um, and just wondering why. Um, and I remember when I asked, why do animals have to be killed to become meat? And I got a pretty flat answer, because that's the way things are. Meat comes from animals. And it's pretty exciting to be able to stand before you a few decades later uh, and to be working towards a future where we can give a different answer to our children. My own son is only a little older than I was back then. And I love being able to tell him that we're creating a future where things that were don't always have to be. We can imagine a future where things can be different. Each of us may have taken a really different path here today or into this industry, but we share a collective mission and a collective responsibility to build a future of meat and of food that is more sustainable, that is better for animals, and that is better for the world. The world needs us more than ever before. You might have read or heard of the, the recent UN Global Report on Climate Change. The Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, characterized it as a code red for humanity. The alarm bells, he said, are deafening, and the evidence is irrefutable. And we know that our food system in general, and meat in particular, is a very large contributor to the problem. Livestock production in general uses almost one third of the world's land and water and accounts for an estimated 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. On top of that, it's incredibly inefficient. It takes almost 34 calories of energy to produce one calorie of meat. There has to be a more efficient path forward. In addition to the environmental impact, we are all too familiar with the public health issues and implications as well. We probably heard for years around issues around antibiotic resistance and bacterial contamination. But what we've all learned in the last couple of years is that we have to contend with global pandemics too. If you recall back, uh, back in 2018 and 2019, there was a swine flu that really overtook the pig um, and, and porcine herds in China. It led to the culling of a record 200 million pigs in one fell swoop which was a whopping 25% of the entire world's pork supply. I happened to be living in China at the time um, and experienced things that you didn't quite expect to see in 2019. Um, lines at the market, rationing coupons, price fixing, all to try to maintain order, while a key protein um, that Chinese consumers depended on was in short supply. Add to the global pandemics like swine flu, our, our COVID-19 that we've been dealing with, we all know how many different supply chain issues and all the other implications that have been wrought by COVID-19. And you probably remember, um, in what may seem like a long time ago or just yesterday, all the issues at slaughterhouses that also led to shortages and price increases here. Let's not forget about the animals. There are an estimated 70 billion land animals, 
70 billion with a B, that are raised and slaughtered for food each year. Most of us would probably rather not think about the suffering and the pain and the slaughter that has to go into bringing meat into the table. But I think we can all agree that it'll be a spectacular day when we can enjoy the meat that we have always loved without the need for slaughter. All these challenges are happening, environmental, human safety, bacterial and animal welfare, at the same time that the world's population is continuing to grow at a rapid pace. And in fact, it's estimated that there will be 10 billion humans living on this planet in 2050, and that the demand for meat will double by that time. I know that's a little heavy. I promise there's some good news coming. And the good news is that unprecedented challenges require unprecedented solutions. And the great news and why we are all here today is that cultivated meat can be part of the solution. Growing meat from animal cells instead of relying on animal slaughter will transform our food system for the better. It allows us to have the meat that we love and provide a future for our children and the planet that is more sustainable and more humane. This mission is exactly what brought me into this industry. Throughout my career, I have always loved and been a passionate fan that business can be a force for good. I spent almost 15 years at PepsiCo before joining Upside Foods, working across our food and beverage businesses in both North America and Asia. While I was at PepsiCo, I had the privilege of starting a social enterprise called Food for Good that has helped serve over 50 million meals to children in need in the US. I served on our Human Rights Operating Committee to help make sure that we were doing business in the right way. And I also learned a lot about running really complex businesses in a global context, all of which will help me in really good stead in my new role at Upside. I have always been drawn to science, to food, to social impact, and the ability for business to be a key needle mover in the world and in the biggest challenges that we have. The chance to build an industry and a company uh, from the commercial ground up, if you will, and to change the world at the same time sounded like a perfect opportunity. And then there's one other thing, which is that I love meat. I grew up in Texas, um, and I have always loved meat. Uh, if you ever come to Upside, which I would welcome any of you to come, you'll find that we are a passionate team of people who are about to change the world and committed wholeheartedly to do that. But we've also got vegans and vegetarians and passionate meat eaters under one roof, um, and this is one thing that can actually bring us all together. I joined Upside Foods earlier this year because I wanted to help make meat a force for good. I wanted to be part of the next chapter, I couldn't have joined at a more exciting time, either from the company's perspective or for the cultivated meat industry at large. Our team has spent so many years, as have so many people in, these, in this room and who are watching on the webcast, proving that it is possible to cultivate real, delicious meat from animal cells. I always joke that all the hard, heavy lifting of the science, can the cells actually grow? Can they make delicious meat? was all done over the last five or six years, and I had the privilege of coming into the company at a time where we were ready to bring it to the world. We've come a long, long way as a company and as an industry since 2015, when Upside Foods, then known as Memphis Meats, first was founded as a company that was focused on cultivated meat. It was the first one in the world. The idea that you could grow meat from animal cells was kind of swirling around, but I think if you asked most people, they would say that this was science fiction or something that was decades off into the future. Today, there are nearly 100 companies, many of whom are represented in this room, that are working to bring cultivated meat to tables around the world. We were the first at Upside to unveil cultivated beef, chicken, and duck, and now we know that everything is possible from steaks to sushi and everything in between. The progress has not gone unnoticed. And interest in the cultivated meat space has never been higher. Over half a billion dollars has been invested into the space, with over $350 million in the last year alone. In addition, you'll see a really interesting conglomeration of folks who are interested in the space, a diverse set of investors and organizations that believe that cultivated meat is an important part of our future food system. Upside Food raised the first Series A and first Series B rounds in the industry. When Upside brought on Cargill and Tyson as investors, there were no other meat companies invested in the space. Today, there are a variety of food companies in the traditional space that are interested and excited about cultivated meat. 
Many of them will tell you in conversations that this has moved as a conversation from if to when. Whole Foods has joined us as an investor as well, and we're looking forward to partnering with more retailers to bring these products to consumer shelves. You'll also notice uh, that we were privileged to bring in some big names like Bill Gates and Richard Branson. Um, and in the news, you've probably heard of other celebrities that are now investing their time and their energy and their passion into cultivated meat. This is all a really good thing. And of course, on top of the food companies, the celebrities, and the impact investors, there's also a wide range of traditional financial investors who see that this kind of product, cultivated meat, is not only good for the world, it's good business too. If you look at these things, it may seem like a peculiar coalition, uh, but I like to say that this problem is so big and so challenging that it's gonna take innovation and collaboration from every corner of the world to make it happen. There are other signs too that the industry is maturing. Although cultivated meat products have yet to make their way onto shelves in the United States, Singapore last year became the first country in the world to approve, regulated, uh, to approve uh, cultivated meat. In addition, regulators around the world are actively in conversation. They're expressing strong interest in moving forward with approvals and in cultivated meat as a solution for their countries and their food populations as well. Handfuls of governments have allocated funding and research dollars, and we're seeing the same thing with universities as well, setting up centers, research department, degrees, and coursework as at the same time. And finally, we're starting to see a really exciting amount of collaboration between companies. We're a burgeoning industry of almost 100 companies, but we still have a lot of work to do together to make this industry a reality. Upside is a really proud founding member of AMPS, the Alliance for Meat, Poultry, and Seafood Innovation. Here in the US, uh, we're excited to be part of AMPS and to be doing a lot of the groundwork to make sure that as an industry, we're having the right conversation with regulators and with consumers to give transparent information about what the industry is, what cultivated products are, working hand in hand with traditional ag and food players, to have conversations around things like nomenclature and labeling to make sure consumers know exactly what we are when they're buying and choosing our products. Everything I just mentioned demonstrates that the industry is blossoming and off to a really fantastic leg of the journey. We've hit so many milestones that will help lay a really solid foundation. But there's one more thing that makes me really, really excited. And this, to me, may be one of the most important achievements at all. At all. Our products are delicious. With all the focus on science and technology, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that this is food. And when you think about what consumers think about meat, first and foremost, they want meat that is delicious, that is craveable, that is the meat that they have always known and loved and had as part of their family tradition and culture for generations. And we need to talk about food like food. People want meat that is delicious and that will change the world, but they want it in that order. People say that seeing is believing, but I believe in this context, tasting is believing. I'll give you a little story that, about my own personal journey that brought me here to Upside. I spent months poring over every single industry report, every consultancy's predictions, talked to every single person who I could, who knew anything about the space, to ask them about cultivated meat and what they thought about the future of this industry. After a couple of months and lots of conversations, I was intellectually convinced that the future of food lay in cultivated meat. My heart was aligned too. This was an emission that was so big and so transformative that I could throw my entire passions behind it. But there was one more thing I needed. My taste buds needed to be convinced as well. So in the middle of the pandemic, my husband and I flew for the first time in a long time, came out to California from Philadelphia where we were, met the Upside team and Uma, fell in love with them, and had a chance to try our chicken, uh, which you can see pictured here. I'll tell you, and this is a spoiler alert, that it was simultaneously the most remarkable piece of chicken I have ever had and the least remarkable thing I've ever had. It tasted just like chicken. But if you ever doubt that what we are doing here collectively as an industry, as companies, has the chance and the potential to change the world, I can tell you that it's already changed mine. That one bite of chicken was enough to convince me 
to sell my house, quit a job that I love, and move across the country to start a whole new adventure with all of you. So what's next? We've done a lot already, but there's still a long road ahead. I really think that we are at a historic inflection point. Lots of questions about whether the basic science works have already been answered. We have spent, as I said earlier, many, many years proving that the biology works. You can grow cells and cultivate them and feed them outside of an animal's body and create meat that is amazingly delicious. There are three big things, though, that I think are still on the horizon. And they're all about the transition that we need to make from thinking about ourselves as a science and technology industry only to also becoming really consumer and commercially driven. First, regulatory approval. Second, building scale. And finally, consumer education. Let's talk about each one in turn. Of course, getting the green light to sell our products in the US and in other jurisdictions around the world is on everybody's mind. We can't wait to get that final green light, and I think all of us will be very, very ready to put consumers' uh, taste buds to the test the next day with delicious products that didn't require animal slaughter. But while we're all eager to get products in front of people, we also need to realize that this is an incredibly important part of building a solid foundation for the industry for many, many years and generations to come. The regulatory process of establishing safety and trust and transparency for consumers is critical to making sure that consumers understand that this is safe as well as delicious. We must get this one right. The next big step is to scale our innovation so we can bring our products to a wider audience. We've already done the hard work of showing that the science works and that cells can produce delicious meat. But now we need to build out commercial facilities, we need to build out more robust supply chains, we need to build creative partnerships that allow us to continue to move down the cost curve to a point where it is affordable and accessible to all. These are easy things to say, but really hard things to do. And any of you who have been working at it for some time know the reality and the truth of that. Many of you may have also read some of the critiques that have come out recently on the industry and on the sustainability and viability of the industry as a whole. We spent a lot of time looking at these and we take them really seriously. But I'm also reminded in talking to our scientists and talking to our colleagues that there are so many things that everyone said could not be done that we have already checked off the list. So we've got a playbook to go, we've got a lot of work yet to do, but I'm confident that the future of food is coming and we're all marching towards that reality. At Upside, we are excited to be soon announcing the opening of our first production facility and innovation center. It will allow us to make meat at a scale that has never been seen before, while also allowing us to continue developing the next generation of technology that will help us bring cultivated meat to the world. We couldn't be more excited to hit this milestone and hope you'll join us soon for our virtual ribbon cutting. We know that others across the country are working towards this goal as well, and it's exciting to see a critical mass around the industry starting to move from the lab and from bench scale into production facilities and ultimately into commercial size facilities. In addition to regulatory approval and to scale, it's time to talk about consumers and consumers educating, educating consumers about who we are and what we are and why we have a role to play in their world. At Upside, we took a big first step in this direction when we rebranded ourselves from Memphis Meats, which we had been founded as, uh, to Upside Foods. We wanted our brand to reflect the essence of who we are and what our product and our company is all about. Delicious, sustainable, and humane meat. We wanted our brand to have universal appeal, to be fun and welcoming, and to be able to inspire consumers to join us on a journey to transform the world for the better. One delicious bite at a time. The way we see it, the future of food is all about upside, and we couldn't be more excited about welcoming consumers into the journey with us. We need to help educate consumers also about who and what we are as an industry. And we found that oftentimes having voices other than our own can also be really helpful in that process. We know for a fact that the more consumers learn about what we are and who we are, the more excited they become. We recently partnered with Dominique Crenn, who's a three Michelin star chef in, here in the Bay Area, to, to work on our overall product development and help bring our products to market. She took meat off her market in 2018 due to environmental concerns about the way that meat was made. 
but is excited to bring it back to her menu with upside foods because it's meat that she can feel good about. As an aside, if you ever have a chance to work alongside a three Michelin star chef in a, in a kitchen, I highly recommend it. It is an amazing experience to see how someone who thinks about food in this way plays with, talks about, imagines, and just feels food um, deep to the core of her body. And we've been so inspired and so privileged to work alongside Dominique as we help imagine um, what our meat and our products could become and the role that they can play in consumers' lives. And then there's documentaries. Um, some of you may have seen the documentary that recently came out called Meet the Future, um, which was narrated by no other than Jane Goodall. Um, or maybe you even saw this week um, David Chang's new show on Hulu, The Next Thing You Eat. It's fun. I have to tell a funny story here, and this will probably make a lot more sense if any of you are marketers or real consumer-driven people in the room. So if you're like me, you spend a lot of time thinking about how to communicate. What is our product? What is our brand? How do we talk about cultivated meat? And is it cell culture meat and cultivated meat? And where does it come from? And being able to explain to consumers everything about the process so they get comfortable with who we are. Um, and then you've got David, who told us, he's like, hey, I'm going to be on the Jimmy Kimmel Show. Take a look. And of course, David just then sits there and says, you know, the chicken was pretty damn good. Um, and I think that pretty much captured all that consumers need to know about Upside's chicken. Studies have shown that two-thirds of Americans would eat cultivated meat. And for some, it might take longer to embrace it. But for others, the choice to pick a more sustainable, humane option that is still just as delicious is probably a no-brainer. Gen Z consumers, more than any other consumer in the world, care about the planet and about the role that they have in preserving it. They're willing to vote with their wallets in real ways, and they bring, they're going to bring the rest of the world with us, uh, with them, whether we like it or not. There has been tons of research done on environmental sustainability and food and how much people are willing to pay for food that's more sustainable and how many people are willing to try new products. Um, and they're all a great read, and I encourage you to look at them. But I'd also encourage you to do a little bit of research on your own just to see how different the next generation of consumers looks, feels, and makes decisions. I did a little bit of this on my own. I mentioned that before I joined Upside Foods, I spent months in this very academic study of reading everything and doing a ton of research and talking to people and wrestling with the idea of how do you wrap your head around meat that doesn't come from an animal and that doesn't require slaughter. And it took me months to get there and to be convinced that this is the future of meat. When I decided to join Upside, or right before actually, I decided to call a couple of my teenage cousins and nephews and nieces. Um, they all knew that I was thinking about a job change, and I figured it'd be good to get a pulse on what they thought about things. So I called them up one, and one, one by one in turn, and I said, hey, what do you think about cell-cultured or cultivated meat? And they're like, well, what's that? I said, well, it's delicious meat that doesn't require killing an animal and it's better for the world. And they all kind of looked and they thought, hmm, how do you do that? And they're like, oh, you grow the meat outside, outside of the animal. You don't need the animal anymore, and you do it in a fermentation tank. It's kind of like brewing beer or growing yogurt. And they said, amazing, I'll try it. Where can I try it? Um, and it was about 30 seconds, um, and I just laughed because I generally view myself as not that old. Um, but when I started talking to my teenage friends and family members, I realized that a process that took me months took them a matter of minutes. And that's the generation that we're growing up with, um, that will become the purchasing power of tomorrow, that will make decisions, and that will bring us into the future that we all deserve. I'd like to close with one of my favorite quotes and one final thought. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The road ahead will be long. It will be winding, it will be tiring and discouraging at times, but it will be worth it as all hard things are. I'm privileged to be on this journey with all of you to transform our food system for the better. Together, I'm excited about making our favorite food a force for good. Thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to having a conversation, taking some questions, and to staying in touch. We have a, oh, sorry about that. We have a, a microphone here for any Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to come up to this microphone and, and we can address any questions. Thank you. I'm only taking easy ones. <laughs> Oops, I guess it's wrong. This is 
is either a really good sign or a really bad sign. <laughs> Hi, Amy. I had a question. Um, what advice do you have for people trying to get into the industry if we're in another industry working right now? Yeah, it's a great. Can everybody hear the question? Um, so the question was, how, what advice do you have for people who are trying to get into the industry? Um, I think what's really exciting about where we are as an industry um, is that it's going to take all types to be successful in the next chapter. Um, so it, if you look at our own company, uh, we started with a lot of scientists and people from the biopharmaceutical and pharmaceutical world and academic labs, but now we're adding people from the food world, we're adding people from technology companies, um, we're adding places from nonprofits, all sorts of non-traditional places. Uh, so I think my advice would be to figure out what your incredible super, uh, super set of skills are uh, and figure out how they can fit into the industry that we're building. Um, conferences like this are a really great opportunity to network. Um, it's a really young industry. We're all excited about collaborating and about talking with each other. So feel free to flag anybody, uh, myself included, over the next couple of days and have a chat. Hi, I'm Jess Krieger. I don't know if this is confidential information, but do you have a timeline for when Upside Foods is going to receive its first regulatory approval for cultivated meat products in the United States? Jess, that is a great question, and I really wish I could answer it. Um, but I'd need a little magic eight ball, which I don't have. Uh, we have been in conversation with uh, FDA and regulators for a number of years now, um, starting a couple years back when we helped to establish the framework recommendation on a dual jurisdiction between FDA and USDA over cultivated meat and poultry. Um, since then, we've been really excited about the kind of collaborations and the conversations that we've had with regulators. Um, but at this point, I uh, can't make any real prognostications other than hoping that it will come very soon. Thank you. And for the young lady who had her question before me, come talk to me because we're starting a women's group to get people involved in the industry who are specifically in STEM looking for a career in CELAG. My name is Paul Carl from Genscript. Abby, thank you. This is a great talk. I'm interested to learn how this uh, Singapore company all got approval already from the government and also do they offer commercially at affordable price? If, they, if yes, maybe I should try it next time I go to Singapore. Thank you. Sorry, the question was around whether there is a prize? A, a price, okay. Uh, the price for the food. Uh, so yeah, so I think um, at the outset, it'll start at a price premium uh, relative to what you would see from conventional meat. Um, I think in the long run, we expect to continue moving down the cost curve. So you've seen some pretty spectacular declines already from you know, the first millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars pieces of meat um, down to now what is kind of on the premium end of things. Um, so it's a huge focus for the industry and for upside as we continue to scale is thinking about all of the different inputs building a robust supply chain um, and making sure that as we build, we are scaling in the most efficient possible way. Yeah, I'm so interested in you say the uh, Singapore government already approved chicken. Is that commercial available down in Singapore? Yeah, there's a approval for a chicken nugget product in Singapore. So yes, you can fly over there and get it. And I've heard that they just lifted their 14-day quarantine so you can even get it without that. That'd be a very expensive meal. Thank you. Hello, Amy. My name is uh, Adomas. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your story. Uh, my question uh, uh, relates to what are the preconditions required so that cultured meat uh, really takes a significant share from uh, traditional meat? And to be more specific, I believe one of them is cost. So people will definitely pay a bit more for sustainability for the fact that you don't need to slaughter animals. But I wonder, have you thought what are the limits for cultured meat, what price could it theoretically be, and in what time, and what consumers are ready to pay? Yeah, I think no, that's I think a it's fundamental a... question that I usually lack answers to, and I know that your company is one of the most advanced, so really interested in what, what do you think about this? 
No, thank you for the question. Uh, it's something that we think about every day. Um, I'd say there's the three things that I talked about are really going to be the gatekeepers for the industry and any company scaling. So regulatory approval is first. It's binary. Um, once you get it, obviously, we can start selling. Um, the second thing is really about how we scale. Um, so I think one of the, the big things that we're focused on at Upside is making sure that we can scale not only the physical bioprocesses, but do it in a way that's thoughtful and cost-effective. Um, so that includes things like media, which you've probably heard a lot about. Um, being one of the costs. So thinking about how you take costs out of the media, things like fetal bovine, serum, and other animal components coming out, um, scaling up the kinds of media components that are required to operate at the scale that we need um, for massive, ultimate global. Um, all of those things are really part of the step-by-step -step, um, requirements to really build the industry from where it is now and a lot of these smaller production facilities that you're seeing starting to pop up and that will open up in the next year or so into true commercial scale. Um, but I think there's a tremendous amount. If you look at any industry, um, I'm kind of a geek when it comes to studying things like cost curves, but if you go and Google um, what the price of semiconductors was before or of processing power, you might have heard of things like Moore's Law, right? Or if even if you look at cell phones um, and think about satellite phones when they first started 30 or 40 years ago, um, no one probably could have imagined then that every single one of us would have an amazing computer in our pocket that's more than what was required to send the man to the moon. Um, so I think human ingenuity has always solved for these almost seemingly intractable problems, and I don't think that this will be any different. Um, the reality is that the pressures on this industry to get to cost efficiency are so much higher than what has been on pharmaceutical industries or biopharma or other industries that have developed much of the underlying technology. So when we bring the approach of food um, and thinking about value engineering and being thoughtful about what costs are necessary or what specs are necessary and what you can take out of the system, I'm confident that there's a lot there um, that we haven't even started scratching the surface on. So it'll be a road, um, and it'll be a long road. And as I mentioned at the outset, we're, as an industry, going to be launching at a price premium. Um, I think we'll get to a point where it is affordable. Um, when you think about the adoption curve of consumers, the top set of consumers that are really excited and that are willing to pay for their morals and values and have the capability of doing so will be kind of the tip of the spear. So they'll start, um, and as that consumer group grows, we should move down the cost curve in lockstep. Um, so ultimately, when you think about you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, 30 years later, um, we, can con we can consume a significant part of the overall market. Um, and I think the, uh, the final thing I'll say is just around the product quality. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier in terms of the product being delicious. Um, if you're a meat eater like me, I have always loved the idea of plant-based alternatives, but I have, for whatever reason, never been able to make all of the compromises from a taste perspective that are required to fully make the switch. So I'll try it, but then I'll go back, or I'd just rather eat vegetables or cut down on meat consumption. Um, so I think the onus is on all of us in the room to produce products that are amazing and delicious um, and irresistible. Um, and what I think is really exciting, and we don't have time to really get into this, but we talk a lot about making food now in a way that's familiar to consumers. Uh, but I think the next generation is making food better um, than the way it, it has been. And you can imagine a steak that has the nutritional profile of salmon. Um, you can imagine maybe even kosher pork. Um, all sorts of things that weren't possible when you were wed to animal slaughter and animal agriculture and cultivation um, are wholly possible in this new world. So I think we've got a lot of work to do on the consumer side from an education perspective, from a building of the supply chain and the manufacturing and the efficiencies. Uh, but I'm confident that those two will work in lockstep as we become a more and more important part of the overall industry. Morning. Oh, morning. Good morning. Thanks for the talk, Amy. Steve Maskey from CP Calco. Um, you mentioned your new facility that you're you're uh, going to be breaking ground on here shortly. What what sort of um, if you can say what sort of capacity will that facility have? I mean, is that going to be something that can feed the Bay Area or feed California or feed a rest one restaurant or, or you know what is that a demonstration type thing or a real production type can you say anything about sort of that availability and size yeah I'm gonna have to say stay tuned we've got some announcements coming in the very near future and I think our team would be a little upset if I saw, talked about it now um, but it's coming very soon um, it is exciting it will be in the Bay Area in an area that's actually in a local neighborhood um, so not a place that you would immediately expect to have a meat processing facility so in the very not so distant future, um, I'd love to follow back up on the conversation and chat further um, and invite you either virtually or in person to our facility.